very good afternoon to everybody watching from the elephants here and from myself and everyone else at Safari Live. My name is Lauren and on camera today I have Archie and we are sitting here in the Maasai Mara in Kenya and we're just observing all of these amazing elephants that are in our path. Now these elephants are just feeding quite happily in the sun as it's very hot today. It's about 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm hot and these elephants are also hot. So we are hoping to hear from you today and try our very best to answer your questions. Please don't make them too difficult though. So all you need to do is tell your questions to your parents or guardians and they will send them into the email address natgeokids at wildearth.tv. So that's natgeokids at wildearth.tv and we really hope to hear from you. You can ask us as many questions as you like about what we are seeing right in front of us on our safari. So these elephants here are obviously all traveling together as one big herd. So they stay together, they travel together and they're feeding. They're quite relaxed. They're just eating away, probably having a late lunch or early dinner, but you can see that they're hot. Now, how do I know that these elephants are hot? Well, because you see how they're flapping their ears back and forth like this? This is what elephants do to help them cool down. Now, I'm hot and I'm probably a little bit sweaty because humans sweat when we get hot, but elephants cannot do that. So they're very, very big animals and it's actually not very easy for them to cool down. So one of the best ways for them to cool down is just to flap their ears back and forth like this, like an air conditioning unit, and it helps them to cool down in this heat. They also love spending time near water. And I am just gonna move my car because there's another vehicle and I have gone and blocked them in. It's very rude of me. So what I'm gonna do is just move my car to the side so that all the traffic can pass. Naughty Lauren, she shouldn't have done that. Anyway, there we go. I think there's plenty room for the vehicle to go past. Let me just check. Yes, there is. So now we're in a little bit of a rubbish angle, but that is... Oh, Rosalind's asking a great question. How long can elephants go without food? Well, we're on a bit of an angle, but that's nothing that Archie can't handle. The other car hasn't indeed passed us. So let's see if I can just angle it a little bit better. Actually, they can't go very long without food because they are very, very big animals and they do feed all day long. Now, they're quite poor at digesting. There we go. That's better. So that means that when the food goes through them, they're actually not very good at digesting it and taking all the nutrients from it. So that's why they need to keep eating a lot and a lot all day long. A bit like me, Rosalind, they eat a lot. I love my food. So as long as they have water, elephants could survive a little while without food, but it is indeed important that they eat regularly. And the elephants that we see here are eating every single day, all day long. Now they're big animals, if you think of it. So they've got to keep eating in order to stay big and stay strong. And they're herbivores, which means they only eat grass. So they're big animals, but they do not eat meat. They're not carnivores. So they will just make their way along all through the land, eating the grass, the shrubs, and indeed the bushes. Now here in Namara, there's lots of grass. The grass is actually very, very long right now. If I was to walk, it would probably reach up to my hips or maybe even higher. And I'm a very short person. And indeed, the elephants feed mainly on the grass here. So I think we are going to continue our travels on I do apologize about my voice, boys and girls. I think I've got a little bit of a sore throat today. 
However, there might be some elephant traffic in our way, but we shall see when we get there. So, as I'm gonna keep driving, hopefully, if I just stalled my car, we are gonna send you all the way down to South Africa to say hello to my friend, Steve. Good afternoon, boys and girls. Welcome down to South Africa in the Sabi Sands. My name is Steve and I'm joined by David on camera. And as Lauren has told you, please ask your parents and guardians to send through whatever questions and comments you have on Wild Earth Kids at <laughs> Sorry, at Natio Kids at WildEarth.tv. We have got a beautiful bird here in the afternoon, and we've probably you've probably all seen it before from the Lion King. It's called Zazu and the Lion King, although this is a different species to the one you would have seen in the Lion King, but it is a hornbill, and this is called the Southern Yellow Hornbill, although it looks very similar to all of its other relatives. This one sitting in the shade of the tree because it's relatively warm today. It's almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit and well the birds are in the shade. We saw a very big warthog a moment ago but he was in the shade as well but as soon as we looked at him he ran away. So this bird is in the shade and it's busy using its beak to clean itself. And you find when it gets hot birds will find somewhere nice and shady to do all of their ablutions. They will clean, they will scratch, they will get rid of all sorts of parasites that they might have on the body there. Can you see he's busy rubbing against the tail. Uh, above the tail is a gland and on that gland is this very sort of water repellent sort of uh, chemical that it's able to take and put back on the feathers because birds essentially they need to be waterproof otherwise they'll get very sick out here in the rain. So what you find is they'll spend time in the day, almost every day, they'll rub themselves, they'll clean their feathers, um, straighten the feathers almost like a zip. Have you ever had a zip that's gotten a bit, a bit skew? That's pretty much what birds' feathers are like and so what they do is they, they unzip them and then re-zip them again so that they lock together to enable the bird to fly perfectly. If they didn't fix their feathers every single day, it would actually influence their energy levels, uh, almost like driving a car with a flat tire or a broken wheel. It eventually just gets very, very difficult to do. But anyway, that is one of the birds out in the sunshine, and it is quite hot, as you can tell. We're gonna be heading down the road to a very nice watering hole, because that is where animals are probably going to be today. Uh, if you wanna find animals on a warm day, check the local watering holes. You know what I mean? We're going to go down to a place called Chitwa, which is around the corner. So jump on board. I hope you're having a wonderful afternoon. So we are in South Africa. Lauren is about 2,000 miles north of us, so a lot further away, but also in the savannah biome. But you might notice as we go along, when you see up in the Masai Mara, it's much more open. Whereas here, it's very, very dense. Lots of trees and uh, also quite a lot of grass but up in the Masai Mara there's lots more grass and a very interesting differences between the two and David Gitu who's up in the Mara now he knows the place very very well and he would like to say good afternoon well hello boys and girls of Nat Geo and how are you all doing I'm sure you have seen me before, but if you have not seen me before, my name is David and on camera with me today is Bungay. Bungay, how are you? You might not have seen me for the past few minutes because we've been on the road and we're doing a bit of cruising because we want to look for some animals. Now, apart from us showing you the animals and telling you one or two things, I will also be teaching you my local language. My local language here is called Swahili. And just like where Lauren is and myself were in a country called Kenya and Kenya is a country that has over 40 tribes. When I talk of 40 tribes, those are tribes that speak different languages. So we have one national language that is called Swahili and my one word that I'm going to teach you today is Jumbo. I'm sure you can also say Jumbo, Jumbo which means hello. So do not forget that one. I'm sure all my friends have already told you that we like talking to you. 
We like getting questions from you. We like hearing some nice comments from you. As you show not your kids at worldas.tv. You can always request your parents or your guardians uh, to do that. Now, my plans today is to go and look for some lions because of all the cats we have in Africa, uh, I'm talking about cheetahs, leopards, and lions. The three big cats that we got here, I love lions. And where we are, in the Mara Triangle, as Lauren told you, we got so many pairs of lions. But there's one particular one that I love and I like following. Now, I want to head that direction, but apart from Steve, Lauren, and myself, there's another gentleman who we have given him a nickname. I don't want to say his nickname now. He might say it by himself, and he would like to say not hello, but maybe jumbo jumbo to all of you. Hello, David, on a beautiful, beautiful sunny afternoon here in South Africa. You can see there's a few little clouds in the sky, but nothing threatening when it comes to rain, and it is the perfect weather to be out on a safari. Now, it is a very, very good afternoon to all of you. As David mentioned, my name is Tristan. On camera, I've got Senzo this afternoon, and we hope that we're going to give you the most wonderful time as we explore South Africa and Kenya. Now, I've stopped here because I want to show you guys something quickly. On the road to my right-hand side, which we're going to try and show you because it's a little bit difficult to see. But essentially, over here, I'm going to just draw a little circle around it, is a track for a leopard, all right? So we, we are out in probably one of the best areas that we can find leopards, and we've come across this track, and it's a track for a female leopard. Now, where we are at the moment is exciting because the female leopard that walks around here is a female that has two cubs. She very seldom, well, we haven't seen the two cubs yet. We've seen one, but not the two together, and we haven't seen her for quite some time. Now, I'm not sure if it is exactly her or not. Could be a, a sort of other female that's just moving through and has pushed a little bit further than it should, but it could very well be that female, and that's exciting because maybe these tracks, if we follow them, are going to lead us to her cubs. It will be super exciting to see if the cubs are around. And initially, when we first found the tracks, I got super excited because there was a track that looked just like one of the cub tracks next to her foot, but I think it was actually a civet. I didn't check for long because we're trying to follow the tracks as quickly as we can to see if we can find her. Um, but I don't see any cub tracks here, which means that I'm pretty sure she is moving around on her own. The problem is, is that we weren't out on game drive this morning. So we were, you know, we're doing much longer drives in the afternoons and so we're not out in the mornings. And so I don't know whether these were here this morning already or if these are from during the day. If they're from during the day, then we have a very good chance of finding her, which is exciting. So we're gonna try and see what we can do. Hopefully she's lying somewhere in the shade close to the road and she'll be easy for us to spot. But we'll endeavor to try and find her. If nothing here, then there was also reports of our two dominant males having a bit of an altercation at some point this morning. Um, so we're going to go try and see if we can maybe follow up on them. So lots happening. In the meantime, though, while I follow these tracks, let's send you across to Steve, who's got a feathered friend that he wants to show you. Thanks, Tristan. Good luck tracking those leopards. Well, we heard some birds shouting, and you can hear them shouting. The guinea fowls on the floor, they're like a very big chicken. And this bird in the tree is called an African, ha uh, African hawk eagle. You see it's got very streaky chest with a dark head and dark back and white belly. And now there are two of them, and this is a true eagle. If you look all the way on the feet, all the way down, there are feathers all the way down. And well, these guys, they hunt in pairs and they like to hunt small mammals and small medium sized birds. And the guinea fowls that you could hear shouting are hiding underneath the bush here. Because it is very tricky for the eagle to come in underneath the bush and catch them. So that is a strategy that they use. And quite often, because they hunt in pairs, the one will fly and scare the birds, and the second one will come from the side like a team player and catch the birds. And they'll go off together and they'll be able to eat on it. Here are the guinea fowls just on the floor on the right there, Darby. We might be able to get a little view of them. Here we go. 
Here's the helmeted guinea fowl. Ugu, you think it's a handsome eagle. It is one of my favorites, in fact, the African hawk eagle. Uh, we had them breeding on our property last year. We had a nest just up the road from where we are now, so it's very possible it's the same pair because large eagles like this are very territorial uh, when it comes to food resource and they keep other eagles of the same species away. Yes, there's a second one, just a little bit more left. He's just moving in the middle of the screen now, bottom right, yeah. There he is. There's the second one. It's not a very good visual of it. You can basically just see its foot behind that tree. You can see it moving now there, its back and its tail. So they like to hunt in pairs, as I said. So if you ever find one, a very good chance you'll find a second one. And, and now it's all about whether the guinea fowl are gonna be patient enough to stay underneath there, or if the eagles are gonna be patient enough to wait or go off in search of better prey. So the calls that you hear now sometimes can lead us to a leopard because they make exactly the same sound for a leopard as they do for an eagle. But if there was a leopard, they would probably all be sitting in the bush off of the ground. They are not happy, are they? So that is what we call an alarm call, everybody. So not only do we find tracks out here, but we also listen to the alarm calls of antelope and birds, and they help us to find what's going on. And very, very often, very often, most of the time, in fact, we'll be tracking a leopard like Tristan's doing now, and we'll hear alarm calls, and then we go in and we find that cat busy moving. So the bush, it's very important to not only be able to see what's going on, but also to be able to listen a very easy call. There we go. The eagle just flew off. He just landed in the tree next to his partner. And now the, the, the birds have gone even more crazy because they can't see it anymore. Okay. Well, we're going to carry on around the corner here. We've got a really big watering hole just around the corner called Chitwa Chitwa. We're hoping to maybe find some elephants there drinking. But in the meantime, let's go back up to Lauren in the Masai Mara, who's on the search for all the wonderful animals up there. I have got some elephants. Other ones. There is just so many elephants around today. What I'm gonna do is just find a better position. Not like last time. I don't wanna block anybody. I've learned my manners. And here we have a very big elephant and a small elephant together. There we go. Let's see if we can just, Archie can get it from here. There we go. So it's a very, very small elephant. And a big one. Oh, there we go, my car again. Okay. There we go. So you can see this is a very, very young one. Look how small it is. So when elephants are first born, normally they actually fit they're so small that they fit underneath the mother's tummy. So this one's obviously a little bit older, but you can see just behind there that it, oh. <laughs> I think mommy's gonna hide it. You can see that it is a very small elephant and very cute and oh, there we go, isn't that adorable? <laughs> So this isn't actually the same elephants that we were with earlier. This is different elephants. There is literally elephants everywhere today. Traffic jam of elephants. And it's actually starting to get a little bit cooler. There's a nice breeze coming through. So it's going to make it a little bit easier to be an elephant. They can get rid of all that heat now and cool down after a very hot day. Now, I don't think this elephant's very happy to be on camera. Let's put it back to us. <laughs> but you can see they're much... Oh, I don't know what it's... What are you doing? It's put some grass on its back. And now it's trying to shake it off. 
So when elephants are born, they're not very good at using their trunk. Now, it takes a long time to learn to use a trunk. It's a bit like us. Now, we have to learn to use our hands to write. We're not born with the ability to pick up a pen and write. We have to learn that at school. So it's a bit same, a bit of the same for a young baby elephant. They are not able to fully use their trunk. They have to learn how to do it. And it takes a lot of practice, a lot of watching mum, <laughs> and a lot of messing around like what this elephant is doing now so it's probably just playing with the grass and also just trying to learn to use its trunk it's probably going to take a lot of work to coordinate all of those muscles in the trunk and eventually as they will get older they will get there and they will be like this big one that will use their trunk for many different reasons they can breathe through their trunk. They can make noise through their trunk. They can pick things up and pull grass with their trunk. They can communicate with each other using their trunk. And they can even breathe and use it as a snorkel when they're swimming. Elephants do love to swim. They love water. And they can put their trunk outside of the water and actually breathe just like a snorkel. How amazing is that? Now, when you see a young elephant, they can also use their trunk to hold onto mummy's tail so they don't get lost. So the trunk actually has many, many uses. And I'm a little bit jealous. I didn't see. I didn't see. I wish I had a trunk like that. Now, I just want to make sure that we are still live. I just heard a little thing from Nina in my ear, so I will wait till she confirms. But of course, I hope we are. I hope you are still with us watching this adorable baby elephant here. So we are still live and we are now going to send you all the way down to South Africa to see what Steve has. Well, everybody, welcome back down to the Chitwa Chitwa watering hole. And as promised, we said we'd find you some animals that are near the water. And we were hoping to find you some elephants like Lauren has got with their very long nose. But instead, for the moment, we have found some warthogs. And, well, very, very cool. They were lying in the mud before. Warthogs, like elephants and buffalo, love, and rhino as well, love to roll in the mud. The mud covers them, it actually is very cool and also helps to, to cool them down and also kill any ticks that might be sucking on their blood. Here you can see how wet that individual is on the left there. He was in the water having a proper little mud wallow and then there's one little baby behind. Now quite often you'll find warthog families with lots of little youngsters. Now, I'm not sure who or which family this is but last time I was down here about well, when I found warthogs about a month ago, there were seven little youngsters. But unfortunately, in these environments, there are so many predators, such as leopard and lion. And leopards really enjoy catching little warthogs. So it's very, very difficult for them to survive out yet. Very, very difficult indeed. And here we are at the watering hole. And one thing you can almost be guaranteed with finding at the watering hole is big animals like hippos and also big animals like crocodiles and we've got both of them around and about crocodiles obviously are very dependent on water and they live in the water and when they get very hot and they'll go back oh did you hear that hippo saying good afternoon boys and girls <coughs> Now that was me pretending to be a hippo, but hopefully they'll make another noise soon. But look at the size of this crocodile and those very brave birds right there behind. Now I wouldn't go anywhere near a crocodile if I was a bird. What do you think? Look at them. There's a plover there. There's um, a blacksmith lapwing. There's a sandpiper there. So they are very brave walking around the edge of the water feeding on insects. And uh, they keep a distance from the crocodile. Not that the crocodile is looking for small birds like that. Look at the size of it. Look at it. Wow. 
and there's a thick knee standing right there on top of the crocodile. Now well, you're a very brave bird. So crocodiles spend a lot of time lying in the sun because they are reptiles and they are basically, their body is an enormous solar panel. So they don't need to eat like we do. You know, when you're very cold, you have a nice meal of soup and you feel very warm afterwards. Crocodiles don't do the same thing. They basically, they need to just spend time in the sun to warm themselves up. And then when they get hot, they go in the water to cool themselves down. And well, it's very interesting because that's what reptiles do. But then when we get hippos, like you can see in the top right of the picture, they're also very, very dependent on water. And well, they're a mammal. Now, you all know what a mammal is. Mammals are warm-blooded, which means we eat food to, and the digestion of that food keeps us warm. Uh, reptiles can go a very long period of time without eating. They kind of go into sort of like a, a, a state of, of inactivity. Uh, but hippos, they save their energy just like reptiles do. So when hippos are hot, they go in the water. And when hippos are cold, they come out and sit in the sun. So they, they behave like a crocodile, which is very, very funny, I think. Um, and then they come out at night time to eat. Oh, there we go. The crocodile just opened his mouth. Well done. He's yawning. You don't often see crocodiles waking up in the middle of the day and opening their mouths. It possibly means that he's getting a little bit warm in the sun and he might turn around and go back into the water. Look at those teeth. Incredible teeth, aren't they? Now, I wouldn't want my leg or my arm to go anywhere near there. Many, many of the waters and rivers in South Africa have got crocodiles, so you have to be very careful if you go swimming very very careful indeed my dad grew up in africa and they always used to have a friend sitting up in the top of a tree and then they'll all go and swim and then as soon as a crocodile would come they'd throw stones and all run away but that's what boys do i suppose never stop them swimming africa gets very hot in the summer if you didn't swim we'd probably all all melt but uh, i wouldn't go swimming in this watering hole right here they are hippos and crocodiles that are both potentially very very dangerous to people the hippo obviously is not going to eat you the crocodile probably would but the hippos are quite protective of their area samsung you wonder if the water levels dropped and it has indeed this is the lowest i've seen it um, we've had rains but rain it's important where the rain falls and it hasn't really fallen too much around this watering hole to fill it up last year about this time it was all the way up you see that tree in the middle of the picture and that's on an island last year around this time even later in the year that was all underwater so it potentially is going to be a very hard time for the animals living in this watering hole um, the hippos and the crocodiles need to be able to cover themselves with water otherwise they will dehydrate with the rain so if they don't manage or well not with the rain with the sun so if they don't get enough water they'll have to move they'll have to move somewhere else Ooh, we've got someone busy swimming there we go that is a water thick knee having a little bit of a bath and making me very jealous on this warm afternoon because wouldn't we love to do that now remember i spoke about that bird earlier the hornbill that was busy uh, busy keeping itself or doing its feathers preening was trying to keep the waterproof on if you see the feathers there, the feathers, they shake the water off very, very easily because there's a waterproof coating on the feathers. And so they'll wash themselves, uh, get all the dust off, and then they'll reapply that coating to the feathers. And that's to keep them waterproof. There we go. Look at that in the sunshine. Oh, Darby, we've got a kudu crossing the road in front of us up on the watering hole there. Don't forget... Please ask your parents and guardians to send through any questions you might have to match your kids at wildearth.tv. We'd love to hear from you this afternoon. There is a female kudu, one of the largest antelope we'll find in the area. And well, I've never seen a kudu mud wallowing to get rid of ticks, but you often find them with ox peckers like that. Can you see those birds on the back? They hold on to the kudu's fur and they actually clean the ticks off of her body with their beaks and they eat them. They physically eat the ticks. Very nice, isn't it? It's a nice relationship though for the kudu, a nice relationship for the bird, with their very specially adapted feet. Two toes forward and two toes back, 
mean that they can hold on to the kudu even at this the shortest of fur areas look at them holding on down the slope she goes and she's going to come down to the watering hole for a drink so if you don't mind Nina if we just wait another moment here yeah, and we'll see the kudu come down she's going to be quite wary they're always very wary coming down you see there's another crocodile above her at the back there so animals like kudu and impala and all the antelope coming down have to be careful of any crocodiles that might be in the water because well as, although crocodiles eat mainly fish they will very very readily try and catch an unsuspecting antelope that comes down to drink so she's going to come down to the more shallow pool over here there we go see how she's coming up very wearily she knows there's danger at the watering hole she knows there's potential threats but uh, she needs to drink so the desire to drink will often outweigh her fear of the impending danger and then she also has to look back to see if there's anyone else coming and well there is actually in a moment you'll see she's going to be joined by a beautiful male kudu or maybe he's going to chase her sorry about my head there here he comes look at him isn't he magnificent where are you running boy oh, oh. I think he's more interested in the lady than he is in the water look at her she's very jumpy everybody the ox pickers don't want to leave her alone they have to drink just like you and I we have to drink otherwise we dehydrate water is very important for the survival of these animals look at the size of his neck those enormous horns I think he's more interested in her than he is in the water he's found himself a nice girlfriend and he's going to follow her well I think that's going to be it for now the kudus are going to be walking off going behind our car so we're going to stay here and see what else comes down to drink Linda indeed beautiful I mean that is a magnificent kudu bull there I mean look at the size of his neck compared to hers sorry about the back of the car but uh, the kudu bulls will use their horns for fighting and they get these really big necks to be able to hold up those horns they are extremely heavy Ah, oh, and there goes one of the largest birds around the Goliath heron is going to come down and land and they are going to be looking for some fish but while we wait for the Goliath heron to show us exactly what he can do let's go back over to Juma with Tristan who's on the search for some spotted cats well our leopard search is not really going well in that the tracks are now heading straight to our southern boundary and I'm pretty sure they've crossed out so I'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to find this leopard which is not ideal at all um, the southern boundary that we're talking about is right here in front of me and so I'm sure she's unfortunately gone over that boundary and I'm just double checking although I don't see her tracks here maybe she's still on our side Maybe she's just gone to one of these little wallows and decided to just rest up there. I'm just going to double check this fire break area because sometimes what they do is they turn um, from this road and then they walk along the fire breaks a bit. Um, but nothing on this side. So I'm going to check a little bit further ahead. I see some tracks in the road there. It could be for hyenas. We're quite close to the hyena den. And so a lot of hyena tracks also mixed in amongst our leopard tracks, unfortunately, which is, which is not good. Um, these are all hyenas that we have here. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to get onto the big main road. And we're going to try and just double check on the big main road to see if there's any tracks crossing. The problem with that is that there's so many cars that go up and down that it's very difficult to see tracks. You have to look on the edge of the road when you're doing it and then hopefully you get lucky and you spot something. But I don't see any tracks for our leopard coming down this way. The last tracks I saw were just before you guys came across to us. So I'm thinking that maybe this leopard did turn and might have moved a slightly different direction. Here's always a good spot to look as well. There's a big road that goes into our southern neighbors and often 
various different cats like to cross over it. So it's a kind of place where you can see quite nicely if any cat has crossed. It doesn't look like anyone's gone over, which is good news. Hmm. Right. Okay, well, nothing that I can see here of any evidence to suggest our leopard has crossed. I'm going to keep checking and just seeing along this road if anything happens. In the meantime, though, I'll send you back across to David in his search for the sausages. Well, boys and girls, I'll tell you what. I'm sure Tistan told you his nickname, and if he has not at one point, he'll tell you what his nickname is, and not much he can do if the trucks are going to a different area. Now, I thought I'll show you why the pride of lions that I'm looking for, they got a particular name, and I want to tell you why we call them the sausage tree pride. Now, do you see that tree there? That tree is called a sausage tree. Okay? Now, I want to show you why we call it a sausage tree, and Bungay will show you some sort of fruit that are hanging below or in that tree. Do you see all those fruits? Those fruits, we call them sausages. Not sausages that we eat, but if you look at them carefully, they take the shape of a sausage, right? Do you all agree is a good name to call them sausages? Yes. Now, the pride I'm looking for, once in a while, we have seen them climbing this particular tree. Not this one in particular, but I'm talking of a tree of the same family or a sausage tree, not this one, but other sausage trees. And because they love to climb that particular type of tree or the sausage tree, that's how we ended up giving them the name the Sausage Tree Pride. Now, there are two main reasons why those lions will climb this tree. Number one, if you look carefully, the tree looks very green. You see all the leaves there? Now, what would happen is, once they climb that tree, they would be able to get some very nice shade from that tree. And the second reason would be, it's also when we have so many flies in the grass down there, they'll go up there. And Sandra, you'd like to know whether animals got test buds. And Sandra will tell you, yes, animals, lions, most of them got test buds because you might see sometimes when they're eating something that they don't like, they'll either stop eating it or spit it out. So animals got test buds. Now, that's the tree that is called the sausage tree. And once in a while, we have seen some lions climbing that particular tree. I'm looking at my side or my right side. I'm seeing an antelope that has been running for the last five, ten minutes. I just want to make sure that below this tree in the shade, there's nothing because as I said, it forms a very good shade for animals. It's very solid tree. Now, there have been an antelope that has been running across the grass. Now it's disappeared and we call them toppies. Hopefully we are going to see more. And let me see if Bungay can get this. Bungay, if you look 12 o'clock, right across there in the grass, it's quite a distance, but I'm sure your camera is very powerful. You see that, boys and girls? That's an antelope and her name is Toppy and she has been running for the last five, ten minutes. And the reason for that, because if you look at the grass, do you see how the grass is being blown from left to right? It's very windy. And now when it's very windy like this, these antelopes are not able to sense very well. They cannot hear very well. And that one or that makes them panic. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what they have to do is just to keep running because they do not know whether anybody would be behind them. She was with a group of another five, but I think she's the fastest. I can't see the other four. You see? She's running and running and running just because she is not very sure who could be following her because the wind affects their hearing senses. You see, she is looking at the back. Now, the challenge is, unfortunately, she could run into a lot of danger as she runs that particular direction. So as much as, yes, it's good to run away from the wind, not sure who is behind you, but at the same time, 
she might run and end up in a lot of trouble. Now, the grass here is quite tall, as you can see. So once we are off the road, we'll always have to drive very slowly as we look for the lions. And I've been talking about lions and lions, and I think Laura might have found baby lions before me. Let's find out. I do indeed have a lioness, a female lion who is eating her dinner. Now, we can't see her too well because the grass is indeed very, very long. But of course, we are able to see her and it looks like she's eating very fast, which means we have one very hungry lioness here. Now, we spotted another one a while back. So there is a potential that there's more lioness around. But unfortunately, the grass is just so long these days that it does make it a little bit more difficult to see the animals but we have spotted that one lioness but we don't know who she is yet we do actually know all the lions in the area but it takes a little bit of time to work out who she is so let's take another look at her because lionesses always stay together with their pride so normally you will see lionesses all together and the collective name for that is pride now Sometimes they will separate, they will go off on their own and they will do their own thing like this lioness has. She's decided to have her dinner on her own. But generally, once she's finished eating, she will try to locate her pride again. Now, prides are very, very important for lioness. They rely on one another and they do need each other. So for now, while we watch our lion eat, we are going to send you across to Steve, who's also looking for lions. Yeah. The Thanks, Lauren. Well, we haven't found anything eating anything. It's probably a good thing. But uh, we're driving away from the watering hole now. Let's see if maybe we can find anybody coming down to want to have a drink. Because um, watering holes, as I said before, are the hive of activity. So if you find the game paths and the roads coming to and from the water, you quite often can find animals like those kudu and elephants and even buffalo coming down to have a drink. And they like to do it normally about this time of day because the lions and the leopards down here in South Africa at this time of day are normally sleeping under a tree because it's so hot. They spend most of their time walking around at night. Oh, there's a beautiful bird in the sky, Darby. So if lions were around somewhere and they maybe managed to catch something, this bird here is called a battalier eagle. And it is one of the first birds to find a carcass, to find anything on the floor. Oh, here we go. It's gone behind the tree. Battalier eagle. Very, very nice. You see them all the time up in the Maso Mara as well as down here. And they're actually related to the snake eagle family. So they're not a true eagle, although their name does say Battler Eagle. Oh, there's a little bee eater. You get him, Darby, just here. There's a very nice bird that, as the name bee eater implies, they like to catch flying insects and bees. And so they sit on the end of a branch like this, and they'll fly off and then land back on the branch after they've caught something. And quite often, See, let's see if we're going to come back to the same spot. Oh, no, he's not playing the game with us today. Uh, he's just gone to the branch just behind that lateral branch over there. Darby, can you see it? Yeah, that's the one. There he is, a little bit more right. Down, left, top left, top middle. There it is. See, it's sort of middle, top right. Beautiful yellow and green bird. There he goes little bee eater and it's one of the smallest of the birds that we see around hence the name little and they like to catch flying insects they're very very good at flying their wings are shaped like a fighter jet so they can fly very very well and they try and catch insects that are flying around and then they come back and land on the branch and often you'll get them hitting the insect against the the branch sort of what we do with tenderizing some steak if you know what i mean they try and tenderize it as well before they swallow it because birds don't have teeth but no birds that i know of have teeth 
And so they want to break it a little bit to soften it up before swallowing it into their sort of in their, their, their crop over here where they can store the food for a little bit of time. Okay, well, we're going to keep going in this direction, see what tracks or what signs of animals we can find. And while we do that, we're going to go back up to the Maasai Mara with David, who is on the search for some lions of his own. Well, Steve, good luck. And I can tell you, boys and girls, between Steve and Tristan, something good might happen uh, before long, before the end of the drive. Well, I'm happy you all saw the sausage tree. And I'll tell you, that particular tree locally here, uh, we do not eat the fruit, but we have used the fruit to make some juice. So we're gonna keep going and I'm just feeling or smelling, I'm getting very close to the lions. So I was saying earlier, that fruit, ideally we do not eat it. What we do, we use it to flavor some local juice. Chris, that's a very good question. And you're asking whether giraffes will eat that fruit. Yes, they will eat it. And it's not only giraffes, we also got elephants that we also eat that fruit and a few other animals. And I tell you what, the fruit itself doesn't have a lot of uh, nutritional value in it. It doesn't have lots of vitamins. It doesn't have lots of minerals in it, but it's very good for digestion because it has a lot of fiber. And that's why you see many animals eating it just to help them in their digestion. And again, as I said, locally here in Kenya, what we do, we'll always get that fruit. And should we make some sort of juice, we'll always remove the husk on top and the inside part of it, it looks like a sponge. And then that sponge, we put it inside the juice and the flavor just changes. It tastes something like some apple juice, very, very yummy. And when we are out there walking, when we are out there walking and we come back home, it's hot, it's very dry. We'll always quench our thirst with that juice because it's always very, very refreshing. Now, this area is the area where the lions I was talking about live. And I'm trying to drive very slowly because I'll have to keep looking in the grass. The grass is quite long, I'm sure you can see that. But what happens is when they want to come out and say warm themselves because it has cooled off, they climb small mounds that you call the termite mounds. And that's where me and Bungay keep looking. So Bungay is looking one side and I also look on the other side or we change our eyes. Hopefully we are going to see them. In the Mara, just like you saw Lauren, we got so many lions and I'm sure you all know groups of lions, we call them prides. So this area we are called the Mara Triangle has over 10 prides. Not sure what pride of lions Lauren have, but I could guess maybe it could be what we call the Olololos. And I'm sure she told you why we call them the Olololos. Because very close to the camp we live in, we have an escapement. Amat, you'd like to know who is in charge of pride of lions, a lion or a lioness. Now, let's look at it this way. In a group of lions, if you see females and sub-adults, or females and youngsters, that one is what we call a pride. And a pride will not have fully grown males. Now, fully grown males will always live separately. They don't live with the females, and they live on their own. And you might see two or three, sometimes four, and even sometimes you might see five. Now, when they are in a group like that for the males, you will call it a coalition. But when they all come together, the males tend to be in charge, you know? 
I'm sure you have heard us saying kings of the jungle or kings of the jungle. As much as most part of the habitat or the vegetation of Africa, we do not have jungles, so the males or the lions tend to be in charge. In general, it's the females that will always hunt for food because the females are smaller in size and they're much faster. You know, they are more agile than the males. And apparently, when they hunt and the males know they have hunted, what will happen is the males are going to eat number one. So again, that emphasizes or that says the males are always in charge in one way or the other. But the males also have very good jobs to do. If there's a concern of safety in the group or in the pride, the males will always come out and defend the females. And of course, if there are also some cubs in the pride, the males will defend the cubs. So I would say in one way or the other, the lions are always in charge. That's why we make this joke and say the kings of the jungle. Very, very good. So boys and girls, I will continue and I'm looking very hard in the grass. Hopefully I'm going to see a tail flick like that. But in the meantime, I say I do that. Tristan is working very hard to look for leopard. So I'm hoping the same thing, David. At this stage, no sign of any animals for us. Either has been very, very quiet so far this afternoon. It looks like our leopard, unfortunately, has crossed out and gone southwards, which is not ideal. So I'm just checking a little water hole on our right-hand side. This is a very popular water hole for our leopards. It's got lots and lots of kind of cover around it, so long grass and shady bits. And for them, they can come and drink here and then they can lie in the shade and kind of hide away. So it's always a good place just to check. Um, so just kind of now milling about, just checking all the water points. It's been a warm day today. And so a lot of the, the animals should be making their way to water like Steve was doing with his hippos at the big dam. So we're going to check all our little water sources in the hope that we can find them. But it's a bit of a pity that that leopard has gone southwards. Um, I'm very intrigued to know who it was because we've got a number of different females around at the moment. And <laughs> It's a little tricky to know who's who and who's walking where. Um, their tracks are not that easy to tell apart. Um, even though they all have different foot sizes, it's quite tricky to know exactly which foot is made which mark without actually seeing them. So it would have been nice just to double check. Um, I don't think it can be the female that we initially thought, the one that I was telling you about that has cubs, because she's quite far from here. She was seen this morning quite far away. So I don't think she would have walked during the day all the way to where we were. So maybe it's one of our other females, maybe one of our small girls, um, like Clalamba, who's moved that way. She's been walking around all over the place of late. So it could very well be her. So we're just going to kind of keep scratching around. We never know, we might get lucky. And also that leopard might come back from our southern boundary and come sort of northwards back into our area. Hyenas were certainly very busy last night. Their tracks are absolutely everywhere. They were walking around a lot. Um, and they will, of course, because they're going to be looking for all kinds of food. They've got lots of hungry mouths to feed. The hyena den at the moment has got seven little ones. And so that means lots of work to feed all those mouths, especially given that they're all getting bigger now. And that's making life a little bit more tricky. Let's just check here quickly. Still hyenas that are walking. So this pan is dried up, which means we won't see too many leopards walking around here. Um, that's the thing now is that as the pan starts to dry up, so we're we going to start seeing our leopards moving to sort of particular water holes because the less water there is, it makes it a lot harder for them to find water and they'll travel to areas that still have. And so those that have got water are going to become a hive of activity over the course of the next few months as we get drier and drier through our winter. And so it's going to be interesting to see which pans get used the most because last year the one very close to our camp was probably one of the busiest of them. And so I think this year it might be very much the same given how little rain we've had to fill up all of our water points. It's amazing though how quickly all these pans have dried. A few weeks ago there was water in all of them, which made life a lot 
more tricky in some respects because you had to check so many more places. Ah, hello little dung beetle. So I'm going to just reverse back so that you can see it. But on the road in front of me is a very, very, very clever beetle that is able to roll its dung around using its sort of front legs to push and its back legs to control the ball. Now you might be wondering why is a dung beetle rolling around balls of dung? Well, it's simply because it's laid its egg inside there. And so that little larvae can actually feed off of that dung ball, which is quite incredible. And it's amazing how they're able to push this ball. They're incredibly strong. If you think about how big that ball is in comparison to them, it's pretty incredible that they're able to actually push it around. Now this one, unfortunately, has hit a barrier and is now stuck by the looks of things. It's got itself into a bit of a thicket, but it's going to engage four by four mode and drive over all of those things. Now what you'll see is every now and then, once it's been pushing for a little bit, it's going to go on top of the ball. And the reason it's going to go on top of the ball is to be able to orientate itself. Now what orientation means is effectively it's to see which direction it should be traveling. So it knows that it can travel in a certain way and it will be able to keep that direction because as it goes on top of the ball, it does a little circle around the top of the wall and it can see the position of the sun. And then it uses the position of the sun to be able to push the ball in the right direction. So it's pretty clever. It's like us. If we see the sun, we know the sun, depending on the time of the day, will be either in the east or the the west and if as long as we keep that in the same place we can travel a very specific direction which is pretty amazing unfortunately though this poor dung beetle has got lots of company in the form of many 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 flies at this stage So, Gabrielle, you say you love them, especially when they fight for a dung ball. It can get quite um, serious when they fight. You'll find that that's a certain type of dung beetle that fights like that. It's the klepto kind of dung beetles. That basically means that they steal from others. Um, and when they fight with one another, it really gets quite intense. They'll flick each other onto their backs and there'll be lots of kind of wrestling that takes place. And either it will be able to successfully take it if it's bigger than the dung beetle that rolled the ball or it gets thrown away and it kind of has to go and find somebody else to steal from. But it is amazing to kind of watch them when they do fight over these balls. Now what I want to see is that this dung beetle I think is actually digging. Can you see the soil just underneath the dung ball? So it's busy burying its dung ball as we speak. Isn't that cool? So it's gone in underneath and it's got a special kind of head that's almost shaped like a spade. And it uses that spade-like head to excavate out a burrow essentially. And then the ball goes down into the ground and then they cover it up and that's where it will stay. And that little dung beetle, its larvae will hatch and it will eat that dung through the course of the next year. And only when it rains again at the end of this year will these dung beetles, some of them, start to come out and they'll then go and do their own thing. But pretty incredible how they're able to dig that ball. I'm going to try to get a little closer so we can actually get a better view of it. Um, let's just try and see, and I've got to remember where exactly it actually is so Senzo can put the camera on it. How much further, Sens? So Sens is saying more, more, more. Oh, there it is. Now, the ball is almost gone, unfortunately. It's kind of being slowly but surely dug down, and you can actually see how the soil is moving underneath. Isn't that incredible? I think it's absolutely amazing how strong these little dung beetles are, that they know how to dig down like that and then be able to bury such a large ball and to move all of that soil is incredible. So slowly but surely the ball will get lower and lower and lower and then eventually it will get covered up and that will be the end of that. Amazing. Nature is incredible, really, when you think of these kind of things. So we're going to watch that little one do its thing and bury that ball. But unfortunately, it is that time where we need to say goodbye to all of you. It's always nice that you've joined us on a Saturday afternoon for our Nacho Kids Safari. Hopefully you had a lot of fun with us this Saturday and that we're going to see you all again um, next week, Saturday, in the same time and the same place. And so it's kind of... Nice that we get to do these Saturday sort of safaris. I always enjoy the fact that we can do these for kids. It's hugely important that we have all of you on board with us. So from David and Lauren and myself and Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. And we'll see you all next week, same time, same place.